for entertainment to the extent that we haven't been entertained already. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to talk about in the next couple of lectures is a completely different, as I've said a number of times, in a sense simpler, um, but still uh, some parts simpler, but ironically um, still being developed to complete the picture to all loop order, although I think in the past few weeks uh, we may have figured out at least one important ingredient of how to uh, make this work. Um, I think we probably have the story to all loop order. But anyway, we'll, 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 we'll see. Um, so I want to talk about an entirely different uh, seeming set of much simpler theories. Um, and so, uh, so, so words are generalized isosahedra or cluster polytopes, uh, polytopes associated with cluster algebras uh, uh, as uh, the amphitohedron in kinematic space, the analog of the amphitohedron in kinematic space, um, but now in, in much uh, simpler theories, in planar, uh, sometimes called biadjoint, Phi cube theory. So that's the uh, that's the topic, um, and uh, it's it, again it, it, this is entirely self-contained. So um, so we can really just start from uh, we can start from from scratch again. Um, uh, let's go back one more time. Um, to our friend, the experimentalist who lives at infinity, who is scattering a bunch of particles together, um, getting some answer for the scattering process and wondering what was going on inside. Um, and so we've already talked in the context of n equals 4 super Yang mills um, when the things that we're scattering are gluons and all the n equals 4 states. Uh, that, uh, that there's a question you can ask in the space of just the data at infinity that gives you the answer, at least for the integrand of the scattering amplitudes, um, uh, to all loop order in the planar limit. Um, OK, so, uh, and there the kinematic space was momentum space or momentum twister space. That's, what, that, that's where most of, most of our action was, uh, was uh, taking place. All right, now I want to talk about a different theory. So, um, uh, so imagine that what's going on inside is something even simpler, okay? So that we just have a phi cube theory, okay? So here, we're, for the moment, we're cheating, um, and we're, we're talking about phi cubed theory. Let me explain this uh, 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 notation. Um, I don't not need to write down a Lagrangian or anything. We're only going to be, for this lecture, we're only going to be talking about trees. Um, all I want is an excuse to draw tree diagrams uh, that are ordered, with an ordering on the external legs. So I want to draw this diagram. I want to draw this diagram. I don't want to draw that diagram. OK? So this is OK. That's OK. That's, that's not OK, right? Um, so I'm only going to be summing the Feynman diagrams that are planar. Now, the whole rest of the story and the part that's being developed 
is true not just to all loop order, but fully non-planar, the whole shebang. Okay, so, but uh, for, for now, we're going to be talking just about the, uh, just about uh, planar tree amplitudes. And um, so again, we're continuing to uh, cheat. So what do these things depend on? Well, they depend on, uh, you know, uh, if I was just drawing Feynman diagrams and I was drawing this guy, um, I would say it's 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. And 1 over p2 plus p3 squared. And I'm supposed to add these two things together, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't, sorry, I didn't, uh, I, 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 forgot to, I forgot to describe uh, how it comes from a Lagrange. So this is what we're actually doing. We're just going to be adding up these uh, planar diagrams. How does it come from a Lagrangian? The Lagrangian that it comes from is one, you know, we're used to getting ordering when we have, uh, when we have colored particles. So the most naive thing I'd want to do is write down FABC, phi, phi A, phi B, phi C. But that's zero, okay? because uh, uh, phi's are scalars. So to make it non-zero, you give it another set of colors. So that's why it's called biadjoint. It has two sets of colors. Okay? And now what you can do is do a trace decomposition in, in, in traces in each one of the color indices separately. Okay? So, and what you'll get are the, all the diagrams that contribute. If you have one trace for one set of colors, another trace for another set of colors, are all of those diagrams that are planar with respect to both orderings. Okay, so that's very easy to see. So you just draw every diagram you can draw, which would be an ordered diagram in the ordering compatible with both of them. If I want to take all of the diagrams, then I'm imagining I'm looking at that piece of the color ordered amplitude, which is the same ordering for both of them. And if I do that, then I'm just summing all these diagrams. There will be interpretations for every other part of it. Okay, so so we're going to get this. Uh, we're going to get these generalized isosahedra, and from them we will see everything. We'll see all the other orderings. We will see the relation between color and kinematics that people talk about as a as a very basic statement in kinematic space. We'll see all kinds of things sort of emerge uh, naturally from this picture. But anyway, this is the Lagrangian that we're talking about, and we're we're dealing with trace ta one. TA1, blah, blah, TAN, trace T capital A1 through T capital TAN. Where that component of it is multiplied by some amplitude M12FN that has a cyclic symmetry, and that's the one that we're talking about here. Okay? Is that, uh, the, the yeah. Sorry? Is there a it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Uh, that it can be SUN and SUM. I'm doing a trace trace decomposition here, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't really care about the end. Yeah. Uh, at tree level, it doesn't matter. At loop level, we'd be doing both both ends large, indeed. Yeah, in order to sum planar planar diagrams. As I said, I mean, what, once we see the connection, that the, the the claim is that there's a connection between all these things and 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 a cluster algebra is associated with surfaces, and the surfaces don't have to be disks; they can be anything. So we could be doing any order in the in in any order in the one over n expansion. That's what we're that's what we're uh, that's what we're ultimately after. But today, we're just going to talk about the sort of simplest thing. OK, so, um, OK, and that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to draw uh, you, what's going on. If you're Feynman on the inside, is that you're, you're summing all these diagrams. Um, I'm going to use some uh, variables to make, oops, let's come back to that later. I'm going to use some variables to make my life a little bit easier. Um, so, and we've been used to this all semester when we have an ordering. We draw a nice polygon, right? So we take P1 p2, and so on, up to pn. So instead of talking about these p's, I'm going to talk about the, uh, what I'll call, this is, this is i and j. Uh, I'll call xij. xij is pi plus dot dot plus pj minus 1 squared. OK? Okay, and so if I do that, if I do that, uh, if I go back to this example, um, here I would write down 1 over p1 plus p2 squared, but this is the same as 1 over x13. Okay? 
and the other one is the same as 1 over x24, right? And you see, there's one nice thing about this already. Uh, we may have talked about this before. I can't remember. But when I write p1 plus p2 squared, well, I could have also written down p3 plus p4 squared. So there's always that little annoyance which one you write down, which is removed when you uh, describe it like this, just in terms of the, just in terms of, of, of the arc. And let's sort of record what I did here. So if I draw my polygon in this case, I took x13, and here I took 2, 4. And it's not coincidental that what I've gotten from these two pictures is just a triangulation of the square. So that, 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 that example is a little trivial, uh, but let's look, at, let's look at the next example. At five points, I would have something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'd write down 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. 1 over p1 plus p2 plus p3 squared. But this is the same as 1 over x13, x14. And here, if I record what I've done, I have this x13 and 14. And it's not coincidental that I'm getting a triangulation of the pentagon. In fact, this triangulation of the pentagon is exactly the dual of the Feynman diagram that we are drawing anyway. If I put a point in the middle, as usual when we draw, when we have duals, oops. Okay, so that's how I get from, uh, from the triangulation of the pentagon to a dual cubic diagram. Okay. Now, what's nice about these variables, so we've seen already seen a couple of nice things about them. Um, but a final nice thing about them, we can see if we just ask for a basis of Mandelstam invariance, kinematic invariance. So all the kinematical invariants we have look like pi dot pj. So that's the most naive thing that you would do, right? Sometimes we met, people might call that sij is pi dot pj. But these things satisfy some constraints because we know that the sum of pj of j is equal to 0. So that implies that the sum over all j of sij is equal to 0 for fixed i. So how many independent Mandelstam invariants are there? The number of independent Mandelstam invariants is equal to, well, n choose 2 for making a pair. Remember, we're, we're assuming for the moment that all the particles are massless. Although they're scalar, so it really doesn't matter. They could have any masses, but let's just say it's, it, it's massless. So it's n choose 2 minus n for momentum conservation. Right? So that's the number of invariants. This is n times n minus 3 over 2. But of course, not coincidentally, this is exactly equal to the number of the xij's. Right? Because that's exactly the number of chords of a polygon. Right? All the n choose 2, except we're not counting the ones on the outside. Okay? So the xij's are both the poles that show up in the amplitude in this ordering, as well as a basis for all the Mandelstam invariants anyway. Okay? So that's, that's why they're great variables. Notice that here we're not saying anything about the dimensionality of space-time. This could, and in fact, it's important we're not saying anything about the dimensionality of space-time. In principle, we're assuming that we're in infinitely many dimensions. The reason is that if you're in, a, let's say, in four dimensions, then starting, starting with five or more particles, there are linear relations between any five momenta. So there's additional constraints on these SIJs that just reflect the fact that you're living in a fixed number of dimensions. So you can't make all these dot products independent just because you can't make all the vectors independent of each other. Those are known as gram determinant constraints. Okay? So they, 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 they tell you that if you take a determinant of a large enough matrix made out of pi dot pj, that's equal to 0. Those are nonlinear constraints on these variables. And the reason we don't care about, I mean, in principle, we should care about them. We don't care about them because the Feynman diagrams don't care about them. Okay? So when you compute the amplitude, it doesn't know about anything fancy happening in 4 or 10 or 15,000 dimensions. Right? So what we're, what we're doing is just keeping track of uh, the sort of propagators that show up. And so, in, and so in principle, the answer is true in any number of dimensions. 
Okay? So we're ignoring these so-called gram determinant conditions that, that, that uh, are these extra constraints uh, uh, between these uh, invariants that are, that are there uh, in a finite number of uh, dimensions. OK, so to summarize uh, our cheating, so this experimentalist doesn't know what's going on inside, but Feynman knows what's going on inside. And the answer that you're supposed to get, the answer that you're supposed to get, this amplitude that we're, that, that we're supposed to get, we can write as a sum uh, for n particles, the sum over triangulations t of the triangulations t of the n-gon, the product of 1 over all of the xij's, where ij is in the triangulation. OK? And so this has n minus 3 poles in it. Okay? So there are n minus 3 of these guys. So is that clear? When n equals 4, we just had 1. Right? When n equals 5, we had 2. Okay, so in general, there's n minus 3 propagators. There, there's, there's n minus 3 factors. OK, so that's the answer. That's the answer. We're going to imagine that we have our friend, the experimentalist, who has their fingers on the Mandelstam dial. They're, they're sitting there at infinity. They have their fingers on the Mandelstam dial. They're moving these things around. And they measure something. And, uh, and there's one theory for what's going on inside, which is that we fill in the inside with a sum over these uh, tree, tree Feynman diagrams. OK. Now, I want to spend just five minutes imagining this alternate universe. Uh, I think we did an analog of this exercise very early on, but let's, uh, let's do it again. Um, I want to spend five minutes imagining this alternate universe where the experimentalist has had their finger on the Mandelstam dial. They've done this experiment. Um, but they don't know the theory, but they, they, they do the experiment and um, they're excited about some qualitative fact about the amplitude that they then want to report to the theorists who are then going to figure out what's going on. Okay? So um, now in, in my story, there are going to be two experimentalists, experimentalist one and experimentalist two. And experimentalist two is going to be the hero, of course. Experimentalist one is what I like to call the closet theorist. And anyone who knows experimentalists knows that some fraction of them really wish that they were theorists. Okay? Uh, so these closet theorists, um, uh, what, what, what do you, well, actually, what do you think any one of these experimentalists gets excited about if they measure this amp? They're moving around the xij's. What's the most obvious thing they're going to notice first? Imagine this is the answer. They're going to notice that it blows up somewhere, right? So good. They notice that it blows up. That's clearly important. It blows up somewhere. Um, but the first person who's a closet theorist knows that blowing up means there's a pole. And they've learned about complex analysis, so they care about the residue on the pole. So they sit near the pole. They measure what's going on near the pole. And what do they discover? They discover that if they do very detailed measurements on the pole, the answer that they get, there's a pole as some xij goes to 0. There's a pole. But if they sit on the pole, they get 1 over xij times the product of two lower amplitudes. They're amazed by that fact, right? They do these very detailed measurements, and they see that there's this product of uh, amplitudes. OK, and they go, and uh, they report this at the conference. And, um, uh, and the theorists think about it. So in other words, they see factorization. Factorization is the star. And there is two theorists in the audience, one of them is named Feynman, who says, I know what's going on is that I'm summing over Feynman diagrams that I'm now naming after me, right? Um, and that makes it manifest that the poles are where they are and that it factorizes on the poles. Okay, so, um, and then there's some other people, maybe uh, uh, this, it's too heavy handed for this purpose, but still, since he's another hero, I'll, I'll, I'll use him. There's Deline who says, oh, I've seen this before. Uh, I've seen this before. Uh, this is the first thing we see in, in when we think about configurations of points. If you have n points on P1, 
You have endpoints on the boundary of a disk, uh, like in our projective language, literally n two-dimensional vectors modulo the action of a GL1 on each column and an SL2. Then endpoints on the boundary of a disk have the property that the boundary of this space also factorizes into two. If you haven't seen this before, I won't explain it now. But this is like a famous, very important, sort of deep but simple mathematical fact that, that uh, if you have endpoints on the boundary of a disk, they're ordered in some way. The, the, the moduli space of those points have this remarkable feature that, for example, if you have four points on a disk, you might think, well, there's a boundary where one and two collide with each other. And it's true, there is a boundary where that happens. But no matter how close they can get, you can do an SL2 transformation to undo it. And then, but three and four are squashed on top of each other. Okay? So the boundary splits into two worlds. One where one and two are far apart, but three and four look squashed on top of each other. And the other one the other way around. So that's this bubble. One and two on one side, and three and four on the other side. And so the moduli space factorizes. So this fact that something interesting happens, and you get, you get a, a, at a, a, in a boundary or a pole, uh, you get something that factorizes. Feynman says, oh, I'm summing over graphs. Deline says, oh, probably there's something to do with endpoints on the boundary of a disk. And both of these pictures are associated with standard ways of thinking about uh, amplitudes for the past 50 years. This is particles, particles in space time. And this is the string world sheet. OK, and then later we discover how these things are related to each other, blah, blah, blah. But I want to say the very beginning is this sort of basic fact. If factorization is the star of the show, then uh, you want to make factorization obvious. Then you're led to thinking about particles in space time or a string world sheet. And now, what could be left? Uh, what else could we possibly want? This is, uh, is there anything more? Is there anything left to be desired? And that's, uh, that's really the sort of point of this, uh, this warm-up part of the lecture, is to just convince you that there is something uh, left to be desired, even in this very simple setting. So back in n equals 4 super Yang mills, we had all this fancy stuff, dual conformal invariants, Yangians, the simplicity of amplitudes, Park-Taylor, blah, thousands of pages collapsing, all that stuff. But somehow, you might think that's amazing that all that stuff is true, but it's because we had to deal with the gauge theory. right? And that's, that's, that's a hint that there was something complicated going on. We needed all this gauge redundancy, da 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 da. But surely, in something as boring as a scalar theory, there's no magic. right? How could there be anything going on in this dumb old theory? Well, that's what we're going to see. There's a, there's a lot of magic even in these dumb old theories. They also have a hidden symmetry, an analog of dual conformal symmetry, even in these dumb old theories. right? So, so at least my own prejudice that it had something to do with gauge invariance and so on is just wrong. There's something actually even more, more, more going on. Yes, sir. Uh, um, could it be the, I mean, in a sense, this entire thing is some, this, uh, uh, Yes, it could be the planar theories are, 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 are string theories. Um, uh, very likely is that planar theories are string theories. The connection that we're going to make uh, is, some, is something that has a lot of stringy flavor to it. Um, but the point is that there are some features, uh, uh, all these hidden symmetries and so on, are there at alpha prime equals 0. They have nothing to do with the strings. So, so there's something. And by the way, we saw this also in Yang, Mills, and Gravity that there's something about the massless amplitude that has this very stringy flavor to it, right? That the fact that we couldn't split things into sum over channels, it had uh, the amplitude where it looked like 1 over st or 1 over stu for gluons and gravitons. So we've all even seen in that context that there is something in the structure of the massless amplitude that has this sort of uh, uh, stringy flavor to it. And anyway, there's something like this going on too. But the, 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 but the, uh, the things that I'm talking about are not, were not, I mean, they were not, they, I, we can't, uh, trace them down is from some fact that we knew at finite alpha prime. It's something, it's something different. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, so that's what we're going to be, uh, that's what, what we're going to be talking about. And what's going to expose these, these structures is to discover that these amplitudes are the answer to a different question. Okay. Uh, once again, that's not uh, summing Feynman diagrams or like uh, uh, doing a Coben nielsen integral over a string world sheet. But it's a different question. And the different question is going to have exactly the same character as we saw for the amplitohedron. We go to kinematic space. 
in kinematic space, we're going to find a positive region. <laughs> the positive region is going to be totally trivial in this case. It's just going to be that all these x's are positive. <laughs> okay, so it's something, not some fancy thing with winding, blah, blah, blah. Just a simplex where all these things are positive. We're going to find a family of subspaces <laughs> that, that, uh, that, uh, that we have to talk about. That family of subspaces will intersect this positive region in a geometry. The geometry will just be a polytope. So just cut out by linear inequalities. Those polytopes will be a sosahedra, and I'll motivate why we should be thinking about polytopes at all, uh, um, but just to say where, 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 where we're going. So we're going to see really a, 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 an analog in every qualitative way of the story that we saw for n equals 4, but now in a different kinematic space. The sort of kinematic space is not the space of momentum twisters. It's a space of these Mandelstam invariants. And the theory we're talking about is, uh, is, is phi cube theory, or bi joint phi cube theory, and not uh, something as fancy as n equals 4 superangulus. But anyway, just to continue with this uh, invitation for a little bit, why would we even think there's anything missing? Why, why, is, there, why, uh, why is there anything left to be desired? Well, uh, to see that, let's think about experimentalist 2. Um, experimentalist 2 is not a closet theorist and kind of hates theorists uh, and is proud of not, of not knowing anything. Experimentalist 2's uh, hero is Faraday. Okay, so, um, so what do you think experimentalist 2 would do? Um, so, so everyone notices that there's a pole somewhere. Um, but this guy is, not, uh, is too lazy to sit there and do some detailed measurements on the res residue of the pole to see what's going on. Right? So what do you think they would do instead? What would you do if you were a lazy but smart experimentalist? Well, you would say, look, if it blows up, let me just try to make it blow up more. Right, so I'm, I have my fingers on the Mandelstam dials, so I'm dialing things around. I make some x, some x blow up. Now what can I do to make it blow up even more? Right, so I have sort of one pole. What can I do to move things around to make it blow up twice, three times? How much I can make it blow up, and so on. Okay, so, so that's what the second guy does. And so, for instance, uh, just at four points, if I use conventional uh, notation for a second, uh, I'd say there's a pole when s goes to 0. But then nothing happens with t. I can do anything I want with t, and there's no further way of making it blow up. Right? From the amplitude, we know why. There's 1 over s plus 1 over t. <laughs> so you make s blow up, and then you're done. Right? Then there's uh, on that pole. On that pole, there's no, there's, the residue doesn't have another, another pole. It's just a constant. So I can send s to 0 or t to 0. And so there's only one way of blowing it up. So there's one pole. And if I say it, I can send x13 to 0, x24 to 0. OK. n equals 5 is slightly more interesting. Now, for example, I can send, I know that I can send x13 to 0. OK? Um, and, all, and all of its cousins, x24 and so on. So there's 5. Okay, there are five ways of having one pole. Okay, but there's but I can also have two sets of poles. But the way what the poles are have an interesting relationship to each other. I can't take any two of these and send them to zero, right? So, for example, l let's say I've sent x13 to zero already. Then I can also send x14 to zero, or x35 to zero. But nothing else. And why is that? Well, we see it. Remember, when I send x13 to 0, that's a piece of the triangulation. But now the point is that there's a bunch of other poles that I'm not allowed to have. And they're the things that correspond to, to other chords that would cross this one. That's exactly the point of locality, right? Sort of point of. Uh, 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 in a sense, the point of both locality and unitarity here are sort of mixed up together, really, is that I can't have these incompatible poles with each other. If I have a pole in one channel, I can't simultaneously have a pole in another one, which, uh, which uh, crosses it. So I can have this one. So if I have this one, I can have this one, or I can have that one, but I can't have this one or that one. OK? So that's interesting. There's an interesting pattern of sets of double poles that are allowed. 
Okay, so there's some, and there's actually five of them. So there's five sets of double poles allowed. Okay, so this is what makes the second experimentalist excited, right? Is that there's a pattern in what and how these poles occur together. And so they'll go to the conference and they'll just list the pattern. Say, here's the pattern. But they're, they're good experimentalists, so they try to present the data in a digestible way. Okay, so you want to sort of just draw a picture somehow that, that, that tells you how these poles occur together. And here's a picture that they would draw. They would actually draw a pentagon. And it's completely coincidental that this is a pentagon again. Okay? Um, as we'll see in a second, it's a more complicated shape uh, as we go to uh, higher dimensions. But what is this pentagon? You should think about this pentagon. You should think about the boundaries of the pentagon as representing the single poles. Okay? So for example, this thing up here, now I'm drawing the now I'm drawing the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is x13, let's say. Okay. So what should it mean when I have two uh, edges meeting? It means that, that, uh, that uh, there's, another, there's another chord on this side, but those two chords have to be compatible with each other, and they shouldn't cross at the edge. Uh, right? uh, they, they shouldn't cross each other. So the vertices here are going to correspond then naturally to a complete triangulation. Okay, so the, the edge is a partial triangulation, and the vertex is a complete triangulation. Okay? And so from here, I would go on to the next one. And so this would be, so, so this is the vertex. That's the edge. So that would be that one, and so on. Okay, so from here, I would go to this vertex, which would be, uh, I guess, uh, this one and that one, and so on. Okay. All right. So, so that's so that's cool. That uh, that there's a way of capturing there's a way of capturing the sort of pattern of poles that occur together in this picture. By the way, if we go back to four points, what is the picture? At four points, the uh, so, the, so this was the n equals 5 picture. The n equals 4 picture is so small, we can just draw it here. It's just an interval. Right. On one end, you would have one triangulation. The square on the other end, you'd have the other triangulation. And if you like, you can think about the interior as just the untriangulated thing. So to repeat, in these two cases, what captures, there is a shape that captures the kind of pattern of, of, the, of the triangulation. Or said another way, there's a shape that captures the pattern of poles that can, that can occur together. OK? There are triangulations everywhere, but no. Th this is not, uh, so what, 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 what is in common, um, <laughs> as we'll see, uh, is that, uh, is that there's, a, there's a geometric object that captures everything about the singularity structure of this amplitude. Okay? It's not obvious a priori that any such geometric object exists. So here we're seeing it's just very slightly surprising that you can take these, uh, uh, that, 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 that you can take this pattern and, and arrange it around a uh, pentagon. Okay? Um, but there is, and we're going to be talking about it. And that's what's in common, uh, qualitatively in common between uh, these stories, that here we're capturing the sort of combinatorics of factorization. And in the amplitohedron, we're also capturing the combinatorics of factorization, but, but in gauge theories, it's where there's more going on. There's also soft limits and, and more. Okay? So that's why the sort of geometry in the gauge theories is, is richer, is this Grassmannian amplitohedral thing. Here we're seeing something polytopal. So going from having to not having soft limits, uh, from not having to having soft limits is going from polytopes to Grassmannian things. Okay? So, um, but, uh, uh, so that's, that's why this story is, is, in a sense, simpler to, uh, to uh, begin with. OK, so now, um, so, uh, so let's say that uh, they want to see, is there something going on um, at n equals 6? What would you do at the n equals 6? Well, if there is some kind of shape, what would the dimensionality of the shape be? 
it would be three-dimensional, right? Because there has to be, so n minus three, it would be a three-dimensional shape. Now, this, this experimentalist is not some math whiz, so they can't, they can't visualize it, okay? They can't visualize what it looks like. Uh, so, um, but what they can do is they can count. They can count and see uh, just how many, how many of these single, double, triple poles are there, okay? And here's what they find for the counts. For n equals 6, they find nine single poles. So this is going to be one, two, three, et cetera, poles. 21 double poles and 14 triple poles. Just telling you what the answer ends up being, OK? Now, the 9, you should, the, the 9 is easy. Just the, the 9 is just a number of chords. Okay? The, num the 9 is just a number of chords on the hexagon, so there's nine of them. So that's the number of single ones. But if you just, if you just count how many, how many uh, triangulations there are, partial triangulations are there with two chords, and how many there are full triangulations with three, these are the numbers you would get. OK? Um, so, so that's what they find for n equals 6. And then they'll just keep on going. So for n equals 7, they find these numbers. Uh, they find, uh, sorry, what am I doing? This is one, this is one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, poles. I'm sorry. And so this was n equals six. For n equals seven, they find 14 single poles. Again, that's easy. It's a heptagon. So I just have seven chords that go across one, and seven chords that go across two. So there's 14 single chords, but then they find these interesting numbers, 56, 84, 42. For n equals 8, they find uh, uh, 20, 120, 300, uh, 330, 132. OK? So that's what they report at the uh, conference. OK, now challenge to you. You're the theorist in the audience. They've already shown you that, uh, that for n equals 4 and n equals 5, that somehow this, this pattern of shapes is captured by, uh, is captured by this geometric object. Okay? Um, now you want to see, could there be some kind of, maybe some polytope, some, some shape that, that captures this uh, information? Um, could there be one? So, uh, what's, the, what's the sort of first check you might imagine doing if you, as a, some smart theorist, uh, uh, has been handed this information? You know, if there is such an object in three dimensions, for example, it would have to have nine faces, 21 vertices, and uh, sorry, nine faces, 21 edges, and 14 vertices. So do you know what kind of check that you might do to see if that has a prayer of working? Euler sum. Euler sum, right? So nine minus 21 plus 14, oh, that's two, good. So it has a chance. Okay. Now let's go on to this one. What should it be here? It's vertices minus as it's supposed to equal. What is it supposed to equal in even numbers of dimensions? It's two and odd and zero and even number of dimensions, right? If you put a one and one at the top and bottom, you get zero always. But but uh, but it's supposed to otherwise it alternates two zero two zero. Okay. So you do the alternating sum of these guys, you get zero. You do the alternating sum of these guys, you get two. Okay. Now, I'm saying this to emphasize how non-trivial this is. This is not an obvious fact. In fact, you can, uh, you can find a generating function that actually calculates those numbers, right? The fact that the Euler sum is 0 is some identity about some hypergeometric function, not some super obvious identity. It's that the, 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 the generating function ends up being some hypergeometric function. So you, you evaluate it at x equals minus 1 in order to do the alternating sum and see if it's obvious that you get 0, right? some identity. It's not super obvious. Okay? So, so it's interesting that that's possible. And in fact, there is a shape that realizes it. And, and that's the shape for uh, just combinatorially for n equals 6. So, okay, so this, is the, uh, this is the n equals 6 uh, isosahedron. So the polytope is called the isosahedron. Our hero 
uh, the lazy experimentalist was named Jim Stashev in the 1960s, okay? um, uh, uh, who essentially asked the same question. Um, is there a polytope that captures uh, the combinatorics of triangulations of a polygon? And, uh, and, um, and the answer was yes, although he actually didn't find the polytopal realization of it. Okay? He didn't find, he, he found something that was topologically a ball, um, but not cut out with flat faces. And the story I heard is that his thesis advisor brought a cardboard cutout of that shape to his thesis defense. Okay, so to show that it was at least possible. Um, but it wasn't for another 10 or 20 years, as I understand, that, that, that people understood systematically how to, uh, how to cut out this object as a, as a polytope with, uh, with, uh, uh, with linear, linear equations. Okay, so, but, so this is just, but this is just representing what the thing looks like combinatorially. And I, and I, and I invite you to stare at this thing for a little while. It's a super cool object. Um, notice it has six faces that look like pentagons. Okay, so there's a pentagon here, a pentagon there, one here, one there, one at the back, and one at the bottom. Okay, so it has six faces that look like pentagons. And it has three faces that look like squares. This square, that square, and that square. Okay? Okay? So, and what do those faces correspond to? The six faces that look like a pentagon correspond to the factorization channels with a six-point amplitude. You know, so this, so here, here I've labeled just what the vertices look like, right? But just not to make it too busy, we, we have to fill in the rest of the picture with partial factorizations. Uh, so here I drew it in terms of cubic diagrams rather than in terms of triangulations, just to go back to the, to the physics uh, motivation. Um, but, the, but, the, but the claim is that every, every face is a single factorization. Every edge is a double factorization, and every vertex is a triple factorization. So what are these faces that look like pentagons? The faces that look like pentagons correspond to factorizations with five points on one side and three points on the other side. There are six of those. What are the faces that look like squares are the things that look like a four-point amplitude on one side and a four-point amplitude on the other side. Okay. Yes? Uh, um, it does, and we'll and we'll be talking about it uh, probably next time. Okay. So in fact, this is a, so there's a there's a beautiful map between the string world sheet and this kinematic isosahedron. Okay. Uh, that ma those maps are the scattering equations, um, and that and that gives a, that's related to sort of the one line conceptual understanding for why those equations work. Is because they're actually there's a mapping you can re you can but really to answer your your question that there's yeah. I'm just saying it again. There's literally a map between the open string world sheet and kinematic space, actual kinematic space. And the image of the open string world sheet, the, the image of the moduli space on the open string world sheet is the inside of this isosahedron that I will be talking about. Uh, I have not defined it yet. I've just drawn this combinatorial picture yet. I haven't told you how things are related to, uh, uh, I haven't said anything about the x's. But we are going to see, and uh, we're going to see this isosahedron literally in the x space in the x space of the Mandelstam invariance. And you should think of that isosahedron in kinematic space as an image of the open string world sheet. Um, the, the modular space is what n, uh, what's the dimension of this n? n minus 3, in general, which is the same as that of the moduli space. Okay, so the moduli space of n points on the boundary disk is n minus 3 dimensions. n points with the 3 removed by the SL2, as, as, uh, as the usual. OK? So, so sorry, yeah, the is n that's right. The interior is n minus three dimensional, and, and all the facets correspond to all the facets of the association correspond to boundaries of that moduli space. Right? So this moduli space is a complicated nonlinear thing. The isosahedron is a completely linear avatar of it, okay? and it sort of captures all the combinatorics of it. And uh, and so there is a there is a nonlinear map. There's a curvy map from the from the world sheet into kinematic space. And that will literally map the world sheet into the isosahedron. So yeah, so that the, the sort of next uh, the, the the sort of lectures of next week will be really about uh, both establishing the connection with uh, uh, cluster algebras and uh, to the small extent that I'll define the only things that, that you need about them for this li limited application uh, and cluster algebra and cluster polytopes on the one side and and the string world sheet on 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 the other. Okay, so this this is really there's a uniform picture for understanding all these things. So, so. if we were to try to generalize this to the Mandelstam invariance, yeah. Yeah, that's right. 
Well, well, I mean, even beyond one loop. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, even beyond tree level. I mean, at tree level, everything will be n minus three dimensional. At one loop, it's n dimensional, for example. Okay, so it's just something, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger object. And, uh, and what we literally understand, you know. One loop uh, planar? Uh, uh, one loop planar. One loop planar. If we do one loop uh, non-planar, it gets, it gets bigger. Yeah, I, and now, now it depends on the particular kind of topology you're talking about. You talk about a disk with an annulus. You could talk about all kinds of, uh, um, you could talk about sphere. We could talk about any surface, okay? But associated with any surface, there is some, uh, at least there's, well, let, let me not say anything about that because we don't really completely understand. Uh, I think we're almost there to understand it. But, but what we understand completely right now is, uh, is tree in one loop, okay? And tree in one loop, there's some analog of all of these. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some object like this. The relation to string theory is very manifest at tree level. At one loop, we don't know what the relation is, and it's completely bizarre because uh, we actually have an uh, object, I don't know if I'll get to it next week, but we have natural objects associated with these things. They even have an alpha prime associated with them. Um, in other words, not only are we going to get ample, let me just say a little bit about where we're going. We're going to think about kinematic space for a little while. So we're going to really go back. This is all motivation for why we should be looking for something polytopal. But we're going to forget about all this. We're going to do something a little analogous to what we did at the amplitude. Go back to kinematic space. Just stare at kinematic space for a little while and ask what kind of question we can ask there. Okay? In, the, in, the, in the story of the amplitude, kinematic space was just n four vectors. Here, it's just xij's. What the heck can you do in the space of xij's? Well, we're going to find something analogous to what we did in the amplitude. There's some chunk of xij space is in interesting. We're going to ask a question on xij space that involves positivity in an interesting way, and the isosahedron will come out of it. Okay? Um, uh, once that happens, you want to figure out how to associate an amplitude with these things. And once again, the amplitudes will be a differential form in kinematic space rather than a function. Um, so you have to learn how to build these differential forms on kinematical space. And there's a, there's a new way of building these differential forms associated with polytopes that naturally has an alpha prime associated with it. Um, uh, for any polytope, it has nothing to do with strings. It's just a very general idea for building differential forms, so, uh, these canonical forms associated with polytopes. However, when you apply that idea to the polytope we'll talk about in kinematic space, you'll discover string amplitudes. No world sheet, no CFT, no vertex operators. You'll just get the Coben Nielsen formula uh, from that starting point. So there are some. So, so there is a very intimate connection between the massless limit and the stringiness of it. Okay? So they're very, very intimately connected to uh, uh, each other. OK, but let me just keep going with this uh, uh, motivation for a little while. So, so I hope this kind of uh, convinces you that there is some fact about these diagrams that kind of seems important. This is what the second experimentalist finds exciting, right? that there is some relation between how all the poles occur together. That's reflecting locality, right? That, that, that we can't have these incompatible poles. That is reflected in this picture. That's somehow non-trivial, that it's possible to uh, glue them together in this picture like that. Now, but you, you say, Bob, what about factorization? You know, so, um, and in fact, this picture also knows about factorization, right? Because how does it know about factorization? You say, well, what do the faces look like? I go to this face, and it looks like a pentagon. Well, that's just what I saw before, OK? I go to this face. And it looks like a square, but a square is just an interval across an interval. So in other words, factorization is also made obvious by the isosahedron, by the property that it has, that on its boundaries, the boundaries look like the direct product of lower isosahedra. We've seen a small example of it here. Okay. So what I want to stress is that this fact that, that the interrelationship, the combinatorial interrelationship between the pattern of poles is polytopal. It's first a qualitative kind of remarkable fact that's not in Peskin and Schroeder or in, sorry, uh, in, uh, in Schwartz, okay? So, okay, is not in, uh, is not in uh, Schwartz. Um, it's not obvious in Feynman diagrams. It's not obvious in string theory. It's just some fact. It's some, it's some, interesting, it's some interesting new fact. And this new fact knows more because it also tells you factorization too. It knows not only about factorization, but also about the sort of polytopal nature <coughs> Of the, of the way all, that all these poles are related to each other. So our goal is going to be to make this fact obvious, okay? to find some picture where all of these facts are obvious, that there is a polytope, that it factorizes on, on, on the boundaries, and, and to have some picture where all these things are made, are made obvious. Sir? 
No, that's right. That's right. And so, yeah. So, so not if, once you go beyond two diagrams. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. This literally, this is literally just planar trees. Okay, literally, this is tree diagrams in the planar limit. But the fact that they they didn't know that it's trees does not matter. I mean, I, I'm just uh, or that that or or that they they didn't know. I mean, uh, I'm just putting it as a stand in there in order to just to draw it in a more familiar way. But they would just give them names. Let's say they 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 might notice that there are nine. There are nine variables that, th that there are nine variables that they're moving around, and they just make a list of the single ones that appear, the double ones, and the triple ones. And the claim is that I can I can make that I can turn that 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 list of relationships into a polytope, where the triple ones that occur together are a vertex, the double ones are connected by an edge, and the single ones are the faces. But the experiment is—it's um, still local, even in the pool theory. Sorry? It's still, the pool theory is still local. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, in this approximation where, where they care about poles, it does. Okay? It's because at tree level, the amplitude has poles. Beyond tree level, it will not have poles. It has branch cuts. It's a little bit more complicated. It's, a, it's the same thing we were talking about, uh, uh, the same general complaint that we, we talked about very early on in the course. We don't actually know the exact analytic properties of the amplitudes ahead of time. And they're, and they're not as simple as just having poles. At tree level, when you have, when you have a perturbative theory, at tree level, it's very simple. It is just poles. Uh, and then at one loop, okay, there's also branch cuts, and you have to talk about what happens to the, uh, so then there's more, more discussion. Although if you talk about the integrand at loop level, then they still only have poles. And so that's why if you're going to talk about the integrand, you can continue in this way and now say at one loop, I also have some loop variable, but all I have is poles in terms of them. And so you can just classify all the poles that you see. But uh, yeah, but, but as far as some exact statement goes, yeah, we, we're very far from being able to make any exact statements. Um, in this, I mean, it's the same problem. It's the same problem as the very start. We do not know. Yeah. If we could measure the exact amplitude, yeah. wouldn't there be some way of figuring out whether the theory was local or not? I wish we knew. That's exactly the problem. No. The answer is, I mean, we know some properties it needs to have, but we don't know all the properties that it needs, needs to have. That's, that's really the problem. That's really, really the uh, the uh, problem. Even for 2 to 2 scattering, even for 2 to 2 scattering, we don't know if I hand you some function of s and t. I don't know how to check that it's right. I know how to check that it's wrong. I can check that it's wrong if it has some random branch cut off in the complex plane somewhere. It should, it should have branch cuts on the, yeah. really bad if it was local. But isn't there some property of the? Oh, it could be. No, no, that's right. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I mean, uh, that, that's what I'm saying. You, you, you could have really bad things. Like, really bad things would have some random singularity off in the complex plane somewhere. Okay. Yeah, that, then that's badly in violation of causality. Or at large, at fixed t large s, it's not polynomially bounded, right? Things like that. Th those are just death knells immediately. So, so, that's so, so being able to tell whether it's local or not, sorry, uh, being able to tell if it's wrong, uh, it can be easy to check that it's wrong. But we don't a priori know what the rules are to determine if it's right. So, so we know necessary, but not sufficient. Definitely, definitely. And it has everything to do with that thing. I mean, it's, a, it's not some weird technical point. I think it's kind of a deep point, but I stress it in the first couple of lectures, that, that and this is, this is why the S-matrix program was doomed, um, was not because, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons, there are all sorts of reasons why they couldn't have found a unique theory, because we know the, can't, the theory can't be unique, any, any reasonable theory is an S-matrix, blah, 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 but there's something deeper than that. Their entire philosophy was that uh, somehow, uh, uh, the only places where the amplitudes have singularities are associated with what we can give physical interpretation to as a physical process in Minkowski space. Okay? And if that's true, then you have a hope of being able to determine by unitarity, because right? you know what's supposed to happen. In other words, the branch points that occur for the amplitude, which correspond to Minkowskian kinematics, have physical interpretations in terms of unitarity. That you can hope to be able to sort of bootstrap. The problem is that the amplitudes have singularities in all kinds of other places that have no interpretation in terms of some process in Minkowski space. And that's, uh, so that's, that's a very early indication that if you're going to play this S matrix game, you have to be a lot, you have to be a little more adventurous about uh, whether you think physics is Minkowski. You know, you, you should be looser about signature, you should be looser about sort of everything, because there's a lot of action 
uh, important action in the analytic structure of the amplitude that you can't see in Minkowski's signature. And I don't need to give you a technical argument for why it's true, because you can see it uh, immediately just in what part of Mandelstam space you cover. Just the part of real Mandelstam space you cover in Minkowski space is half of it for two to two scattering. It's an utterly trivial point. But you want to, all these poles that we're talking about are actually, I, I was lying a little bit because my experimentalist at infinity can't actually, if they're living at infinity in Minkowski space, could not access any of these poles. <laughs> I can't send any massless particle on shell, literally in Minkowski space, right? In Minkowski space at four points, I can't send S, uh, I can't send S to zero without also sending T to zero, without sending just the whole momentum to a zero, right? So, um, and uh, I, co I cover this strange half of STU space. So that's the reason why the S matrix program was uh, really, it was, it was crazy to think they had a shot because there's no reason to expect you can understand all the singularities of this complicated, interesting object only in Minkowski space. So, um, so but anyway, that's the, that's the uh, I, I wish we had a better answer, right? We, um, but, but it could be, as usual, it could be not a problem but an opportunity. That, that, so maybe, that, maybe you really have to sort of go whole hog and make a big guess for what's going on and then derive these things out. That's, that's, the, that's what we've been seeing. I mean, that's been the attitude in this course, to make sort of guesses for what might be going on in kinematic space, um, guided by the data, uh, the theoretical data, uh, uh, such it is as we understand it, and then uh, try to see how the things that we associate with locality and unitarity come out of that. Uh, and of course, we're only doing it in a very limited setting so far, not about the full amplitude. We're trying to do it just in perturbation theory for the integrand and so on and so <laughs> forth. Um, but uh, uh, it's not because we don't care about non perturbative things. It's just the best we can, we, we, we can do. Uh, it's this huge irony I sort of mentioned in the first couple of lectures that, that you know, in the year 2019, uh, uh, nearly 2020, we don't know the answers to questions like this, but we know everything about the Euclidean correlation functions and CFDs and the conformal bootstrap and all that. We know these vastly fancier things, and we don't know about E plus E minus scattering, right? Uh, and I think it's a big difference between Euclidean and Lorentzian, right? Euclidean and Lorentzian, dynamical versus not. And so, yeah, that's, uh, so that's, that's, that's where we are. We, we would love to do something non perturbative if we could. Yeah? Maybe a comment about what you were just saying um, about the also the first direction that you put in. Yeah. Um, so you're saying how very similar to something like the Stevens discussion of baby gravity and studying wormholes, in that as a practical, we have the contribution of Stevens. The wormholes that don't build a collision criteria, you'll see the whole time here on top of that. Um, and probably the same thing for all the non I don't know. I mean, th there. Yeah. Uh, well, we could have a whole discussion about that. Uh, um, uh, yeah. But, but this is. Um, yeah. Um, I think. Uh, just to say something slightly more more general, uh, the fact that we may maybe even know we don't quite know precisely, but you might hope that we we can figure out what the rules are that control correlation functions in Euclidean quantum field theory, and you can say why from that can't we derive everything we need to know about the amplitudes. The answer is that there's this funny non-commutativity of limits when you go com analytically continue a correlation function to pick up the LSD pole and extract a scattering amplitude. And to give you a kind of proof that there's something non-trivial going on, the proof of crossing symmetry in quantum field theory is difficult, is not obvious. Okay? And in Euclidean space, you don't even talk about it. What, you know, there's nothing to order. There's nothing even to cross. So, so crossing symmetries is utterly trivial is almost content free in Euclidean space, but you can't leverage that to prove crossing for the amplitudes. Okay? So there's something, in the end, you know, Euclidean space is kind of a crutch. It is it, a perfectly beautiful crutch in quantum field theory, in local quantum field theory. We might be, we, we should wean ourselves of it if we care about gravity, because, well, at least there's no obvious reason why the Euclidean path integral knows everything about it. We don't even know how to make sense of it, but. Uh, but, but, the whole, but the, the, the whole assumption of an underlying local theory, which is crucial for, to allow the Euclidean continuation to make sense, is probably not true in gravity and so on. So, that, so, so, so doing this is partially practice for that. We're just trying to you know, learn to talk about ordinary physics in real terms. That, of course, ironically, real terms has meant going into 2-2 signatures. So I'm, I'm not being entirely consistent. But, uh, but, uh, but it's at least even more Lorentzian <laughs> than, uh, than uh, uh, Euclidean space. Yes? 
corresponds to back and right shift, so the question mark. Right? Yes? No, no. I mean that there's there's there there is a uh, no one is saying that uh, no one is saying that we don't know what the rules are uh, that uh, to some extent. I mean uh, anyway. But yes, let's say we know what the rules are for Euclidean correlation functions, right? What I'm saying is that knowing everything there is to know about the rules for Euclidean correlation functions does not allow us to derive what we need about the uh, about scattering amplitudes, right? I mean, of course, in principle, in principle, it, it, it's there, but uh, but um, uh, but even, I mean, it's not even a matter of like, uh, in practice, it's hard. There's no algorithm to do it. <laughs> you know, if there was, a, we don't know what the analytic continuation of all these things look like. See, whenever you rely on analytic continuation, it's kind of a dangerous thing to do, right? You're starting somewhere. You go, and then who, who the hell knows what's happening there? There's a cot you want to need to cut. What, what, you know, it, it's a, you're giving yourself a safe home to start with where everything is fine. You want to go where the excitement is. And then, okay, all kinds of new things start happening there. You can't. You can keep stomping your feet and say everything comes from the Euclidean space. Yes, it's true. But you know, at some point, why are you doing physics? Everything does it happens when I do the experiment. <laughs> We're trying to understand what's going on, right? So at some point, you want to have an understanding of what's of what's going on. And so that's what we're trying. That's what we're, we're trying to get. Just as a practical matter, you can know everything there is to know about Euclidean quantum field theory and know nothing about the analytic structure of scattering amplitudes. Not, not nothing quite, but. Little, not 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 enough. Anyway, um, okay. Anyway, so but but we're back to this uh, back to this very very simple uh, uh, this very simple setting. Um, so uh, and of course there is such an uh, as I said there is such an uh, an association for uh, uh, for uh, any any n. Okay, so. Um, so, as I said, our goal is to, uh, is to try to make this fact obvious. Um, but before doing that, I want to tell you one other fact. One other interesting fact. So this is, this is a, a qualitative fact about, the, uh, uh, about these three amplitudes that we want to make uh, obvious. So, so we want to make want to make both the polytopal and factorizing properties of amplitude manifest. And two. Um, Two, there is the following interesting observation. So let's go back to four points. And again, we write the amplitude as, normally you write the amplitude as 1 over s plus 1 over t. Okay. Now, we are instead um, going to be thinking uh, about amplitudes as differential forms in kinematic space. Okay, so. So this is the this is the usual way of thinking about the amplitude, but I but I want to do something else. I want to think about a differential form in this st space. Okay, and we'll be seeing where all this comes from later. But just for now, um, uh, what do you think the form is that we'd want to write down? I mean, those one over s and one over t look like they're logarithmic singularities, right? So probably what I want to write down is something like ds over s plus dt over t. Okay, so this is the sort of first guess for what I want to write down. Okay. Okay, or I, I could write this as uh, uh, d log s over d log s plus d log t. Okay, but now let's say I try to write it like that. Um, there's something slightly wrong with this formula, because s and t have units, right? So really, I should write d log s over mu squared plus d log t over mu squared for some scale mu. But now comes the question. It's a little artificial to have that mu there. Is it possible that, uh, that the answer actually only depends on the ratio of s over t? And evidently not. 
with that plus sign. But if instead the form had a minus sign, okay, then you see this guy is actually just d log s over t. The mu drops out. And it's only a function of the ratio. All right? Now, it might not be 100% obvious why, why we care about this uh, right now. But certainly, there's something better about this guy than, 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 than the first one. Right? This is a form that only depends on the, just the, the ratios of the invariance rather than the ratio relative to some absolute scale. OK? All right, so. Um, and we can actually say this slightly more formally, that, that we want to have a form. We have a, want a form on st, but that, so, so st is naively r2. But I want to actually see if the form is well-defined on p1. I want to see if it's well-defined on the projectivized version of st space. In other words, I want omega of st to equal omega of any function of s and t times the vector st. Okay? And so you see what the, and, and as we've discussed before, that's the requirement for a form to be well defined on a projective space. It has to be invariant under this local GL1 transformation. Okay, so if I take st to any old alpha st, then ds goes to alpha ds plus d alpha s. And dt goes to alpha dt plus d alpha t. And therefore, uh, ds over s dt over t has a piece that goes like d alpha. If I put some a plus b, that's a piece that looks like d alpha a plus b. Right? And that's why I have to have a plus b equals 0 and to doing this very heavy-handed way. OK, well, here I could just choose a sign, and it's fine. But now let's, let's, see, uh, let's see what happens at five points. So at n equals 5, it looks like I would want to say omega is d log x13, d log x14, and then maybe plus or minus its cyclic friends, right? Because that's what the, remember, that's what the triangulation would look like. I would get a 1 over x13, 1 over x14, right? And then all of its friends. So clearly, it's going to be a two form. So I want to write it as d log x13, d log x14. Um, and now, now the question is, can I choose the signs so that this form is actually projectively invariant? OK, and so what happens? When I do the projective variation, again, so when I do the sort of projective variation of uh, omega, the, the interesting part is d as an overall d alpha, right? And so what is it doing? Everywhere I see an x13, for example, I just take it out. And then I have the, uh, the d log of, uh, of uh, whoever it touches. And similarly for everyone else. So you see what I'm going to be left with here is some number times d log x14 plus some number times d log the other ones, OK? 2, 5. So there are going to be five terms here. There are five terms because I had, uh, because 5 is the number of, uh, 5 is the number of uh, uh, single triangulations that I can have. I'm just taking out one of the x's, OK? Now, so already here it's slightly interesting because in order for the variation to be 0, I have to have these, every one of these five numbers has, has to be 0. But I only have four relative signs to play with. That I had a form with this, so, so it's not guaranteed to work just by equations and unknowns. But there's a choice of signs that works. Okay? The choice of signs in this case is literally just add a plus sign, but cyclically shift everyone over by 1. So that's slightly interesting. There's more equations than unknowns, but the signs are such that it works. Now go to n equals 6, and you start to see it gets worse and worse as, as you go up, right? When you go to n equals 6, uh, when you go to n equals 6, how many terms can I write down? I write down 14 terms, right? Because there were 14 Feynman diagrams, if you like. Those were the vertices of the uh, associohedron. 
So there are 14 terms, 13 relative signs. But in the variation on uh, delta omega, how many things have to cancel? Well, it's all the pairs that can show up, because all I'm doing is taking one of them out, right? So all the pairs that can show up is 21. Those were the edges of the, uh, of the isosahedron. So I have 13 equations. I have 13 parameters to play with, but 21 things have to be set to 0. Not at all obvious that it works, but it works. There's a choice of signs for which it's possible. So this is a remarkable fact, that it's possible to give a sign, associate a sign with each one of these uh, wedges of d log x's, such that the entire form is projectively invariant. Okay. Not an obvious fact. But the fact that it's true tells you that there is, and notice that that fact is false for every diagram individually. Just like we saw at four points, d log s, not invariant, right? In fact, you can show that the object is unique. There's a unique form, which is projectively invariant, that's built out of these d logs, OK? Um, what else can you show? Um, uh, And uh, as I said, it's not true of each Feynman diagram individually. But the fact that it's true is some, therefore some hidden symmetry of this amplitude thought of as a form. The fact that it is projectively invariant is a hidden symmetry of the amplitude thought of as a form. What it tells us is that this form has no poles at infinity. <laughs> Literally, right? It has no poles at infinity. Um, you might naively have thought that as a pole as s goes to infinity or as t goes to infinity, but it does not because it's only a function of s over t. Okay? Now, that should sound familiar from what we've seen in, in n equals 4 and gauge theory, right? Feynman diagrams individually have poles at infinity under BCFW shift. And yet, at least there's some way of going to infinity where magically they all cancel, right? And the, the origin of that is a hidden symmetry of dual conformal invariant. And Something like that is true here, too, at least when we think about the amplitude as a form in this interesting way. Yes? Yeah, so when I was going not to include the non-exclusivity Yes. Why is it not trivial that it has to be a function of ratios of the invariance? Because we have no scale to infinity. Uh, well, um, uh, because you're, we, here we're doing slightly, something slightly different. Here we're asking for... Uh, here, here we're, we're, we're thinking about the amplitude as the form itself. Okay? Um, you're, you're thinking about the amplitude itself. Now I'm sort of trying to uplift the amplitude in, into a form. And so you see what, 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 what the problem is. Now it depends how I try to do it. Right? If I put a plus sign here, it's false. If I put a minus sign there, it's, it's true. So, but, but, the, but the content of your question is now the following. I, I have not told you. I've told you this is what I'm going to call some amplitude form. But to finish the story, I have to tell you, how do I get the actual amplitude from it? I don't care about this crappy form. I want the amplitude, right? Yeah. So let me give you the answer to that question, and then, then, then you'll see that what the sort of final invariant content is. Right, right now, we know that it's possible, sort of remarkably, it's possible to, it's possible to choose signs so that this form is, uh, so that this form is projectively invariant. OK, so finally, I need to tell you how we're going to see uh, how we're going to see in kinematic space the isosahedron appearing uh, and how it's related to this form. So let's go back just to this simple example. So I have S and T. I have this form, which is ds over s minus dt over t. OK? So the final thing I'm going to do is I want to get a number out of this. So. Um, uh, what should I do? Well, what, what, what do we do in this sort of much more complicated, much more kind of unfamiliar setting of the amplitahedron? We found a subspace that we could pull this form back onto. But now life is a lot simpler here. Now we have a one form in a two dimensional space. So let's find a one dimensional space we can pull back uh, the form to. Okay, so here's a one dimensional space S plus T equals constant. Okay? And what happens when I when I pull back omega to this subspace, well, it becomes ds over s, ds times 1 over s plus 1 over t. Okay, because 
dt is negative ds on this subspace. Of course, t is equal to c minus s, but t can be anything, right? So long as it's in this, you know, there's a whole, I can move it around, okay? So I can, uh, okay? So that's how we get the amplitude itself. The amplitude itself is uh, obtained by pulling back to these subspaces. But there's another little magical thing that happened, is it was possible to choose the subspace in such a way that all the signs became plus. <laughs> In this case, there's just one of them. It was minus, but on the subspace, I literally just got the sum of the, uh, of the uh, diagram. Now, that's not an accident, because if I look at the subspace, if I thought of these forms as telling me there's some singularity when s goes to 0 or t goes to 0, then it's natural to associate that with this sort of positive region where s and t are both positive. And then if I ask for the intersection of that positive region with this line, the intersection is this interval. This form, ds, 1 over s plus 1 over t, is the canonical form for that interval. Had this sign been a plus, there would have been a minus, and that would not have been the canonical form for this interval. It would have also had a pole at infinity. Okay? But with the, so, so the fact that the correct signs are here are possible is correlated with the fact that we can pull back to a subspace where the form becomes the canonical form for a polytope. Okay, and that's the idea that we're going to start, that we're going to flush out more next time. Okay, so, yes? Yes. That's what we're going to discover next time. Yeah, so we're going to, so, so I was just showing how it works in this example, but, but next time, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it, uh, I'm sort of, uh, setting up what, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about uh, next time. But, um, but I, I wanted to, but let's just uh, summarize. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, I wanted to motivate why there's something still left to be understood, even about this dumb old theory. Okay? And we see there's something left to be understood because there's something somewhat magical about the way, uh, about the pattern of poles that are allowed to occur together. Uh, reflecting locality in space-time, which in this picture is, uh, is just uh, the fact that it's possible to find this geometric object that captures the, the uh, combinatorics of, of, uh, of uh, planar tree graphs or triangulations of a polygon dually. Okay? That object has the, not only is it polytopal, it also has the property that its boundaries are products of lower objects of the same type. And so that thing knows everything there is to know, at least as far as we know to date, <laughs> about the structure of these uh, objects, right? Uh, of, these, of these amplitudes. Not only that they factorize, which we hardwire into Feynman diagrams and even into string theory, but more, right? This sort of polytopal nature. The fact that there is an underlying polytope here is related to us to a second uh, uh, somewhat more subtle fact which is that if, if instead of thinking about the amplitude, we think about this form. See, the amplitude doesn't tell you. The amplitude just says, take all these Feynman diagrams, add them all up. There's no relation between this one and that one and that one and that one. We just add them all up right, and get something. But we're saying that there's actually more. That if I think about these forms instead, that the different diagrams are, are, are related to each other in some way. You know, These plus and minus signs have got to be uh, correlated with each other in some interesting way in order to guarantee projectivity to work. So there has to be some picture that, that uh, uh, in other words, just this observation sort of tells you that they have to kind of be, they're not just willy-nilly plonked down and you're supposed to add them all up. They're related to each other in some way. The relation is captured by these pictures. Okay? And in fact, uh, 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 one way of making these signs work is the following. One way of making these signs work is to start anywhere on this picture, okay, and just take a walk. Now, what happens as you go from one picture to another is you're changing precisely one propagator. So, therefore, there's a piece in the variation that only involves the, the wedge of the d logs of the unchanged propagators. So in order to cancel that guy, you are forced, if you write the d log of all these things down, you're forced to put a minus sign for that guy. Okay? 
And so if it has a chance of working at all, if you take any path through this polytope that visits every vertex once, then you fix all the signs. Now, it's not at all obvious that it still works, <laughs> that if you took another path, that, that, that the signs are all compatible with each other. That's the little miracle. All the paths are compatible with each other. Okay? It's not an obvious fact. As I said, just from equations and unknowns, it's not guaranteed. But, but what makes it possible is that there is a way of sort of saying that the graphs are related to each other. And uh, this is related to the notion of mutation that we'll talk about when we uh, talk uh, already in the simple picture or in more generally uh, when I tell you the little bit that uh, I'll be able to tell you about uh, uh, cluster algebras. But I'm just trying to make another qualitative point, which is that, uh, that, that A, uh, there is some combinatorics in the, that there is, some, there is something uh, remarkable about the fact that the geometry of the combinatorics is captured in this way, which is B, related to this hidden symmetry that this form has, which tells you not to just mindlessly sum all the Feynman diagrams together, but that diagrams are close to others. There's a notion of a diagram and ones that it's connected to and so on, which we don't think about when we normally draw these uh, pictures. Okay. Okay. So that's what we're going to, uh, so I've, I've given you all, all the motivation. But next time, we're going to come back and sort of like forget about all this and just go and stare at kinematic space. Okay, now, kinematic space here is even more boring, even more boring than it was for n equals 4 super Yang mills, because we don't even have these exciting four vectors. We just have these numbers x, i, j. So we're going to just start with the space of x, i, j's. And our first task is going to be to represent the space of x, i, j's graphically, literally. Just write them down, x, 1, 3, x, 1, 4, x, 1, 5, x, 2, 3. But trying to represent it graphically so that the cyclic action is manifest, as well as the fact that xij is supposed to be identified with xji, is going to give us a very interesting picture that starts looking like a 1 plus 1 dimensional space time. And we'll look at that 1 plus 1 dimensional space time, start thinking about causal diamonds in that 1 plus 1 dimensional space time, the wave equation in that 1 plus 1 dimensional space time. Um, this is an auxiliary one plus one dimensional space time that just captures the kinematic space. So it's just kinematic space naturally looks like a one plus one dimensional space time uh, uh, from the appropriate lens. And then we'll ask natural questions in that one plus one dimensional kinematic space whose answers will bring all of these structures uh, to light and let us understand them in some simple way. Okay, so that's the goal for the last couple of lectures. Um, and uh, probably next time that's all we'll have a chance of seeing. Uh, is just how that works and how the isosahedron emerges from this picture of causal diamonds. Um, but then we will, uh, we will, uh, uh, we'll, at, we'll do something very natural from the physical point of view. We're going to have some picture of one plus one dimensional physics uh, with some Cauchy surfaces that we're going to evolve along some Cauchy surfaces. Uh, uh, we're, we're going to take that notion of evolution along Cauchy surface and abstract it away from the setting that it began with as a certain rule of going from one quiver to another quiver. Okay? And that generalized rule will lead us into the world of cluster algebras and cluster polytopes. Okay? And, uh, and when we specialize that rule, we'll see the whole story of, of the isosahedron uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, that the cluster algebras are associated, uh, the, the simplest ones that, uh, that are finite, and this finiteness will have a, uh, you, you won't need to know any of these things. We'll, we, it'll all be self-contained in what we had talked about. Uh, even this notion of finiteness is self-contained in what we had talked about. Um, but, uh, but there's a sort of, there's a, there's a kind of, uh, uh, there's a finite, there, there are finite polytopes that we'll encounter from this point of view. And the finite ones will turn out to be associated with Dinkin diagrams. The, associate, the isosahedron will be associated with the AN class, but you can also do all the other ones. And uh, the ones that have an n have a chance to be related to scattering amplitudes in some way. And bn, cn, and dn are all related to amplitudes, as, as I mentioned. They're amplitudes at loop level uh, of, of diagrams emitting tadpoles for bn and cn, and for dn, one loop. Okay? And so we'll see all of that sort of abstractly from this point of view of uh, playing in uh, kinematic space and abstracting these rules that we'll see for the causal diamonds uh, uh, next time. And so that's, that's, that's the plan for uh, uh, next week. And at the very, very end, I'll tell you what the, what the challenge is for doing it to uh, uh, all loop board. Okay. All right, thanks. <laughs>